how do we determine the risk factors for birth injuries? What can we do as practitioners to educate and prepare our clients for a safer birth? In today's podcast, I talk with Dr. Mariana Masterling, a biomechanics engineer focused on the prevention of childbirth-related injuries, and Dr. Jenny LaCrosse, a women's health physical therapist, about the research they published on factors influencing injuries during childbirth. But before we dive into this episode, I want to remind everybody listening that I am hosting a free masterclass October 15th, 16th, and 17th on how to bring more fun into your practice and avoid burnout. So join me for that masterclass by going to instituteforbirthhealing.com forward slash masterclass. Now let's dive into this episode. Hello, friends. This is Lynn Schulte, and you are listening to the Birth Healing Summit podcast. We are here for meaningful conversations that will transform the way you work with pregnant and postpartum clients. Whether it is a new perspective, tool, or technique, you'll be able to implement it into your practice today. I invite you to sit back, listen with an open mind, and grab the golden nugget today's guest has to offer. Now let's get started. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the podcast today. And I am super excited to introduce you to these two amazing therapists. They're, uh, Je- we have Jenny LaCrosse and Mariana Masteling, and they have both uh, been uh, authors of a review called The Pelvic Floor Injury During Vaginal Birth is Life-Altering and Preventable. What do we do about it? What can we do about it? So welcome to the podcast, you two, and I'm going to give you a moment to introduce yourselves, but thank you so much for being here. I'm so grateful. Thank you so much for having us, Lynn. We really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Jenny LaCrosse. Um, I am a physical therapist by trade. I've been practicing for a little bit over 10 years, and I currently practice at Move Physical Therapy in Monroe, Michigan. I'm also a postdoctoral research fellow with the Pelvic Floor Research Group at University of Michigan, and that is where I met uh, Dr. Mariana Masseling, who is my good friend and colleague, and I will let her introduce herself. Hi, thank you for having us. Uh, So my name is Mariana Masseling, and I'm a researcher in the pelvic floor research group at the University of Michigan. So I'm actually an engineer. So I have a PhD in biomedical engineering from the University of Michigan, and I'm currently a postdoctoral research fellow. And my interests are in uh, preventing injury during childbirth. So we talk a lot about how we can um, help people that suffer these injuries. So my goal is using engineering approaches to try to understand who is at risk so we can prevent these injuries from happening and happening in the first place. Oh my gosh, that is so cool. So I, I love that you're bringing the engineering part to the body. I mean, it's, it's just, that's so cool. Did you know you wanted to get into this when you like started out your path or... So uh, the way I came um, into this research field, I think now it's pretty funny. At the time, I found it was pretty embarrassing. But um, so I always knew I wanted to study biomechanics. And then I had um, a biomechanics class in college. And this professor said, oh, if you anyone wants to do any research with me, just please let me know. And this I'm originally from Portugal. So I did my bachelor and my master's in Portugal. And so I went to talk with him and I said, yes, I would like to work with you. And he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I always play this instrument and I know my body hurts when I play it different ways. And I play the neophonium, which is like a small tuba. And then he looks at me in the full room of my colleagues and he asks me very loudly, so Marianne, are you incontinent? And I'm like, wait, what, what did you, what? I was like, I didn't even know what that was. And he was like, well, we know that young athletes when they jump too much they increase the intra-abdominal pressure and they um, have incontinence so if you raise your internal internal intra-abdominal pressure you probably are incontinent too so go look it up and figure it out <laughs> and I was like sure and so I started learning about the pelvic floor and then I learned that everyone either side that works from Michigan or they were works from Michigan. And so I was like, if I want to learn, I want to learn from the best. And I emailed Dr. Ashton Miller, which who is uh, one of the authors on that paper and said, I'd like to learn from you. And that was like almost 10 years ago. Oh my God, that is crazy. I love that. How you got into this. That's so cool. Jenny, how did you get into wanting to do research? And because you're 
a practicing physical therapist, but yet now you're getting your your doctorate as well. Or I'm not your doctorate, but your your PhD. Uh, so I got my PhD last year in 2023 from Texas Women's University, where I studied um, acetabular dysplasia or hip dysplasia in young active females. Okay. Um, so really it, wanting to get into research was spurred by, you know, I think what a lot of us as clinicians see is you see patterns over and over, you go to the literature and there's not a lot in comparison to what we see in the fields of sports rehabilitation or neuro rehabilitation. And so I thought to myself, instead of being frustrated that this doesn't exist, I think I'm just going to go get a PhD so that I can do research in this area to hopefully improve my clinical practice. And while I will say it is very challenging to try to learn how to be a researcher and be a practicing clinician at the same time, my clinical practice really keeps me rooted and grounded in what are the meaningful problems affecting the patients that we're trying to help with our research. I love that. I love that. So, oh my gosh, Jenny, I can so relate to that. Although I don't think I have it in me to want to go into research, you guys. So I am so incredibly grateful for both of you for being in this field, for doing what you're doing. And, and really, Jenny, that is so critical to have that connection to that, to the patient, right? And how can this research impact what I'm supposed to be doing to help improve their their outcomes. So thank you for, for that. Um, let's talk a little bit about this, this paper then. So this expert review that you guys did, tell us what was the impetus for this? So um, our research group at the University of Michigan, which is called Pelvic Floor Research Group, was started about 30 years ago uh, by Dr. DeLancey, which is one of the authors, and also Dr. Ashton Miller, another author on that paper. And they are the founders and the the mentors at the pelvic floor research group. And about every 10 years, our group uh, writes a paper about, okay, this is what the, we know until now about how the pelvic floor works, how it affects uh, childbirth and postpartum period. And um, the last review we did was in about 2009 in an engineering journal. And so this time uh, as a, we wrote one to a clinical journal, so AJOG, to try to also write that not just in an engineering perspective of how things work and how can we fix them, but also, okay, so what are actually the implications for the clinical practice? And that's how this review came about. Awesome. 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 So um, tell me, what was what was one of your big takeaways from doing this review, both of you? Jenny, you want to start? Sure. So one thing that I will say that I did not appreciate in clinical practice, and it was only until I got here and I worked with people that were not physical therapists. Granted, I think, you know, maybe some of our all, our Australian colleagues and colleagues from Europe are a little bit ahead of us, but I did not realize the importance of the urogenital hiatal size and its implications in prolapse. That was not something I had ever measured with my patients who had prolapse. Yeah. And that's kind of the biggest clinical change that I made after, you know, reviewing papers for this review and then contributing to it. And so I think for the listeners that are practitioners, if you want something to take away that you can do in the clinic tomorrow, we we talk about it in the paper, but just simply using a popsicle stick or they have pop sticks to measure that urogenital hiatus or kind of, um, that's one of the openings at the bottoms of the pelvis that a baby must be pushed through during vaginal delivery for your listeners that are not physical therapists. Right. And, um, and but just that opening is from the top of the vaginal opening to the perennial body, correct? Uh, so usually it's measured from the tip of the urethra to the, to the posterior foreshut, and then you can right. add the, that's the GH, and then you can add the PB distance, which is to the perineal body. But we know that um, there used to be a known association between that size and then the development of prolapse. But some great work from Vicki Honda, who I believe is in Maryland somewhere, um, kind of showed that it might actually be a causal relationship. Okay. And that the larger I, um, and please correct me on this, um, the larger that G GH 
the greater chance of prolapse quicker after birth, correct? That's yeah. one of the big takeaways. So if basically, if, you're, if your um, genital hiatus is small after you deliver a baby, that's a good sign because it means even for it to grow a little bit more, so then the prolapse starts to develop, it's going to take more time. So then if right. someone starts with a genital hiatus that is two centimeters bigger, which is about an inch bigger than a normal size, they have a much higher risk for developing prolapse. And we are talking from 20 to 30 years after childbirth to five to 10. So that's a very big implication. And then we know that when people have a, a subsequent pregnancy, your genital hiatus is going to get just going to enlarge a little bit more. So that's why we also know that people have more children have more risk for prolapse because Every time we have a pregnancy and a childbirth, we are stretching the tissues even more. Yeah, interesting. But that's also the reason why it's much easier for the second baby to be born than the first one. Because in the first one, everything is still very tight. And yeah. the first baby needs to do a lot of uh, pressure and, and might, does a lot of damage. And so that doesn't recover. And so when the second baby comes, it doesn't need to go through a, a an orifice that's about an inch in diameter, but goes by one that is like an inch and a half. So it's much easier to go through. And that's why second birds are normally faster. Right, right. So when you guys, um, when you were writing this paper, you were kind of hypothesizing of how did these structures get injured? And you came up with two hypotheses about the alter, altered neural function and ischemia and uh, retro, um, sorry, I can't say this word, it, reperfusion from compression and levator tearing, right? So that was your your hypothesis. Yeah, so basically, um, we at Michigan, we like we started doing MRIs about 30 years ago. So the first, and then we actually, there is this seminal paper that actually shows that the levator detaches from the pubic bone, which means if your muscles aren't connected on both ends, they aren't gonna work. But right. still in, our world, there's still some people that believe that the injuries happen because of compression, that the muscles lose nerve support and also blood flow. And that's yeah. why the injury happens. But we have already proved several times and other people have proved the same thing, that that's not what happens. And in this paper, we wanted to uh, clearly state that like, that's not what happens. What happens is there is an overstretching and that's why the muscle detached that compression might raise some role, but that's not the major reason why people have uh, pelvic floor dysfunction. Got it. Got it. And, Go ahead. Jenny. And just to add to that, these weren't our hypotheses, like in no. the moment, right. like in the present, it's just to say, these are the existing hypotheses. And then here is the evidence for why Got the it. stretching is true. And the other ones are yeah. not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, have you guys ever in I don't know if you know me, but I'm what I've discovered in the clinic is that the bones of the pelvis, we know they have to open for the baby to come on out. And I find it over and over again in my clinical practice that they don't always come back to their original position. So were the bony movements ever considered in what you guys have been looking at? Have you been looking at there's I know there's one research back 20, 23 years ago, they looked at MRI studies of the bony movements, looking at the changes pre and post um, birth, but they weren't looking at the outlet. They were just looking at the inlet and the mid pelvis. So I'm curious, did you guys ever consider the, the movements of the bone? So we have, like when we started doing these MRIs, one of the People weren't doing those. So then we had a radiologist colleague that looked at them as like, okay, I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist, so what do I see? And in this high-risk population, which means people that were older, they had larger babies, they might have had forceps, so they were already at the high risk for a pelvic floor injury. We saw that the staggering number, and if it's, I think it's about 40%, had some sort of fracture to their pubic bone. Wow. So there is like the bones do need to accommodate. And we also know that the ligaments during pregnancy, they stretch a little bit, increase in size. And there is some, um, there's some papers that show that after, uh, in postpartum period, people that have pain to their pelvic floor, uh, to their pubic bones actually have a uh, pubic fin symphysis about one millimeter longer. So wait, we wait, do longer or wider. What you mean? They're separated. I think the bones are separated a little bit more in the front. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the difference is very small. So while we can 
that is okay so we can try to align them better since we aren't able to change these ligaments and their size um there's still going to be issues that we aren't addressing right now that is going to be remodeling with time but for some people that's not fast enough and they still have some um complaints i don't know if jenny wants to add anything no i you know i think that was a pretty nice summary and lynn i think those are great clinical observations i just think it um I don't know of any literature that exists, which doesn't mean that we can't do it, but I don't know if any literature exists that says that we can have a significant effect on the bony pelvis with um, conservative interventions. Mm -hmm. And again, that's not to say that we can't, and clinically it might help people quite a bit, but from what exists in the literature right now, I'm not aware of anything. Mariana, are you? No, I'm okay. not. And I think, um... People have fractures and the fractures aren't acknowledged. And like you break your leg and everyone knows you break your leg because you're on crutches. But if you your your pelvis breaks, there's not like there is not really anything you can do to acknowledge it. And for many people, this goes unacknowledged and they are like, My my hips hurt. And it's like, and then you try to look back and like, well, you actually broke your hip. And it's like we didn't do anything about it. And some have small fractures that we time they heal and then people feel better, but at the time it's extremely painful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can see tailbone fractures and things like that. I mean, on X-ray, but yeah, what what I'm really noticing you two and and just sharing my clinical observation is that that sacrum, you know, goes into flexion for babe to come on out. And then those sit bones splay apart for babe to come on out. And that sacral flexion is so common that it's stuck there. And, and I, I'm seeing this so clearly in my clinical practice that I'm working with two professors in Arizona to try to figure out a way to measure this. But like you said, Mariana, it, it, it's so slight that I don't think unless I can get to that, <clears throat> excuse me, that level of MRI study, to be able to really measure it, I'm not sure we're going to be able to show it effectively, but that tailbone so gets stretched back. And I'm wondering, because of that sacral flexion, how much of that is contributing to a greater GH in that our um, hiatus opening? Is there a so correlation we there or not? We do know that like, like in a very high scope, anatomy and like I'm an engineer so yeah um, like it does like the levator does connect to the coccyx through like the this ligament the raphe but the reason why the GH opens is because the the muscles and the cranial membrane and other structures they stretch when the baby goes through so it might move them a little bit backwards but that would actually make the things closer to the coccyx so it's a it's a it's a combination of both these things so i don't think they can be exactly related and one of the issues we have is that when we say someone has pelvic floor dysfunction but when someone has a shoulder injury you don't just don't say they have shoulder injury right they say they have shoulder injury to this specific muscles right. and Jenny will know all these details, but this is kind of the analogy uh, our mentors also use. And it's like, we are saying people have some injury to their pelvic floor, but we aren't specifying what. So people have so many different types of different injuries. And that's why it's so hard to one study and understand it because the same way you don't treat every cancer patient with the same cancer drug, we are trying to do that to the pelvic floor and that's never going to work. True, 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 true. Yeah. Well, I to me... The, the whole system, I loved, you guys had a figure on a uh, figure 14. I don't know if you guys probably wrote this years ago, but it shows the, um, the effect of birth on the length of the levator ani muscles. Do you guys remember this one? <laughs> yes. Yeah. The bowling so, ball model. The bowling ball model. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, to me, it, it's like the entire system from bony framework to all those soft tissues need to be able to expand. And if we have any any tightness or inability for all aspects to expand, like 360, it's going to put more pressure on one side more than the other, you know? And so I think that that to me is one of the, I look at that and I go, 
oh, 360, everything needs to be able to move, to open up, to allow that bowling ball to come on out. And, you know, I was wondering with everything that you guys wrote in this paper, I didn't hear anything about um, positioning and birth. And it's so common for um, people to be laboring on their backs in the hospital, which to me might inhibit that sacrum from moving backwards, which is then going to put more pressure anteriorly on those structures. And so again, I go back to the bones, you guys, I'm so focused in, in, in on the bones, <laughs> but if the bones, you know, like everything needs to move minutely in that 360 for that bowling ball to come out. And if we are impacting or compressing one aspect of it, that pressure has got to go somewhere. And so your guys' thoughts on that? So Lynn, you're not the first um, rehab professional to bring this up. Cause I believe in the review, we said that there was, there really hasn't been strong evidence to say that, you know, any given birthing position is better. And yeah. AJOG had a really nice review in 2022 um, Thacker and Sultan are the two second authors. I'm blanking on the name of the first author, but as part of this or part of their review, they do a very nice review of the literature on birthing position. Okay. And what they found is that the evidence is kind of inconclusive. And so with a sacrum fixed, that can actually decrease the risk of some types of injuries, but with it not fixed, it can decrease the risk of some other kinds of injuries, but these decreases weren't necessarily statistically significant. Got now, it. just because something is not statistically significant doesn't mean that it's not clinically important, right? True. And so yeah. I think that's, you know, as practicing clinicians, we say, well, we observe these things and this might be helpful to the to the in the birthing individual and so i think what it really comes down to is that patient centered care and shared decision making and what does the birthing person want to do what is their preference and then their provider knowing the context of all of their other risk factors or lack of risk factors can talk to them about yes, that would be great if, you know, we tried that. Or, well, we don't really know if that's going to minimize your risk, but it's not going to increase your risk. So let's give it a go. So I think this is one of the um, sticking points that I think clinicians sometimes have with the literature and that researchers sometimes have with clinicians is that yeah. from a research perspective, we can't definitively recommend that, yes, this is better. But from a clinical standpoint, we can look at what exists in the literature and make our own clinical decisions based on the person in front of us. Yeah, that's, I, yeah, so important. And, and that's why I think birth is so complex. And, and Mariana, I'm sure you can appreciate that with the biomechanics of everything that has to happen in order to get that baby out. There's, I, I, just trying to figure out how to measure what I'm seeing in the clinic. It's like, there's, there's so many different components to it that um, it, it's challenging. It's challenging to really pinpoint this is the way we should be doing it because it is so individualized, like you said, Jenny. And when you asked a great question earlier, what our aha moments were from doing yeah. this, yeah. and I will say not necessarily from working on this particular paper, but from joining the research group and starting to work with incredible engineers and colleagues like Dr. Masseling, and, um, you know, starting to work with her, I learned about her dissertation and kind of was with the group as she was defending, but I did not completely understand what viscoelasticity was, even though we learn about it in PT school. And I certainly didn't appreciate the variability that exists in the lower birth canal, which was really the work of her dissertation. And so I think it is worth um, her talking about it a little bit because as physical therapists, you know, we do these birth prep sessions. And mm -hmm. while I think these are absolutely beneficial and we talk about it in the paper that you want, you don't want to push against a contracted muscle, but right. even if your muscles are relaxed, you can still have tissues that are really stiff, that have nothing to do with the muscle being contracted. And so um, if it's okay, I don't mean to put you mm. on the spot, Mariana, but if you want to share some of your dissertation work, I think that the audience would really benefit just like I did. 
Yeah, sure. So, um, so as I said earlier, I study injury during childbirth and how we can prevent that and uh, and predict it. And so we um, understand that the pelvic floor muscles and the tissues they are viscoelastic. And what that means is that they are both very stretchy, meaning that imagine you are pulling a hair, a tight band, you can stretch it in one direction and they go very easy elastically, but they also have some viscous component. And viscosity is like when you pull some honey out of a cup of a, a, the jar of honey, you pull it up and then you start seeing how it drips and it, it first drips really slowly and then it gets more and more. And it's because so when you have something that's viscoelastic, it's basically it's both elastic and viscous. And viscous means that when you stretch it um, with the same force, you can see a change in the length. But if you pull it with the same length, you're going to see a change in the force. And that's why. So when when the baby is being born, if the baby is born too fast, it can be, bring issues. And why? Because we don't allow the viscous components to apply. That's why sometimes you hear, oh, we are going to hold the baby there for a second. And why do people do that? They do that because if you leave the baby in place, it's going to stretch the tissues. And it's by the time it stretches, the force needed over time reduces. So if you reduce the force, you have less risk for injury. Okay. Now, on the other side, if you stretch it too much for too long, you bring injury. So it's like, it's not, it's like- Fine line, right? <laughs> exactly. So what we are trying to do is can we, quantify, which means measure and tell the difference between a population of people that are going through vaginal delivery. And uh, we found that these variations are very significant, about seven times between individuals. And so while we know people have about all similar anatomy, they away and the easiness for stretching varies so much across people that it's like, you might be doing all the right things, but if you just were just born with muscles that are stiff, there is nothing you can do that will change that. And so can we do other things? Is physical, is a pre like pregnancy physical therapy is going to help? Like we don't really know because we only figured out we can actually measure this reliably a couple of years ago. So we are working on that. But how, how do you measure this viscoelasticity? There is several ways we can measure this. There is several companies on the market that are trying to do that. There is several uh, research labs that are trying to do it. So I see there's going to be a big push and development in this area in the next five to 10 years. So hopefully at some point, someone can go into a clinic and measure that and be like, oh, you have stretchy muscles, you have don't stretchy muscles. What can we do about it? Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Because you can definitely, Jenny, I know we can feel as practitioners the difference in someone who's hypermobile versus someone who's not. And so that same applies to, to this tissue. So are you saying in that similar vein, like someone who has Erlos-Danlos syndrome or hypermobility, the quality of their tissues are going to be more viscoelastic versus someone who has more stiff tissues? Is that what we're talking about here or not? So we haven't, I don't think anybody's looked at this as it relates to Ehlers-Danlos, so I don't think we can make any conclusions about that, but yeah. more so that just in kind of the average person, there's a sevenfold variability in how stiff or stretchy the tissues of their lower birth canal is. Mm -hmm. And so when I first learned about this, I was a little upset, like, oh, well, then what's the point of doing anything if like we can't you know, if this just exists as it is. But the more I thought about it, I think it's a completely different frame and that it's really freeing because I see a lot of comments on social media where birthing individuals make these comments like I did everything right. And, you know, I did PT and I did, you know, I did all these exercises and I did X, Y, and Z and I still got injured and they're blaming themselves. And I think this is freeing to say, yes, that's fantastic. You did all those things. And there's nothing else that you could have done. Like this is genetics. And so how do we then help you move forward from where you're at instead of think, you know, circling around this blame, I should have done more. And so, you know, I think it's just an important piece to understand and a piece to consider um, as we are also working with people on 
um, pelvic floor muscle coordination and relaxation and birth positions for pain modulation um, and partner support. Um, so, you know, the list goes on and on, but I just think it's one of those things that, again, as a physical therapist, I had never considered more um, tissue level properties that for an engineer, you know, they think about wow. properties of materials all the time. Well, and so like my mind goes, uh, well, how do I feel this? How do I feel the difference in my client's tissues to be more aware of, you know, like, is it palpable this, you know, like the, the stiffness versus that elongation that, you know, some people have such beautiful elongation of their tissues. I always practice bearing down with my clients or they're pushing and so is, is that what I'm looking at? Like the quality of their tissues to be able to elongate, or is there some, some other quality that we as practitioners need to be looking at? So there is some evidence from the midwifery literature that says if you uh, do perennial stretching in late pregnancy, that there is some evidence that it will reduce your risk of um, uh, oasis with obstetrical anal sphincter tearing. Um, which is not the same with levator injury. You can have one or other, or you can have both together. Um, but so it means that basically if you stretch your, and people can, it's a manual stretching, so it can be done by themselves or by their partner or a provider. And we know that in late pregnancy, and when you do that, it's going to, it's just because you are telling your muscles, okay, because you are not going to go to the gym and lift a hundred pounds right away, right? You lift 10 pounds and you lift 20 pounds and yeah. so on. And so basically that's what you're telling your pelvic floor. Okay, this is my two pound stretching. And then one, in a couple of weeks, it's going to be an eight pound stretching. That's my baby. And some people that we do not have, we do not have evidence that you can quantify these properties okay. in pregnancy. However, we think we can, because in ultrasound, when you do ultrasound to the perineum during pregnancy, we know that in the third trimester, they are, genital hiatus, which is that opening we're talking from the urethra to the vagina, um, th that already increases during pregnancy. So there is changes that are happening to the tissues. And me as an engineer, I know that those changes change the, it, the these changes happen because the material properties, which is how stretchy, how viscoelastic tissues are, are changing. But then what happens between you are just okay, and then you're going to labor, there is this enormous change and so that's going to change even more and some people have tissues that respond to this hormonal and chemical change and some people have tissues that do not respond as well or to the same extent and so some people are going to have an easy way to stretch their tissues and some don't but currently we do not know that and this is still an, a working hypothesis and so we are looking to ways we can actually quantify this. Wow. So Lynn, to answer your question, I don't, there's not a good way that we can say, oh, you can, this is what you should be feeling for in your patients. I okay. mean, I think all the things that you mentioned and, you know, I think anybody who's a body worker and does touch can tell when something feels a little bit more stiff versus not, um, or kind of how much stretch or range a tissue has. But in terms of what does viscoelasticity and differences in viscoelasticity feel like in our patients, I don't think that we 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 don't know yet. Hopefully one day we will. But right now we can't say here is the clinical test to do to measure the viscoelasticity of your patient's tissue. That would be so cool, wouldn't it, Jenny? <laughs> it would. <laughs> to actually have that. Oh my gosh. All right. So you guys, your conclusion with this was that um, we can use some guidelines to assess women prior to the labor to get a sense of whether they're going to be a good candidate for birth, or maybe we should just recommend a C-section, correct? Do you guys want to talk about what, do you remember what those recommendations were? Mariana, I'll let you talk about it since capacity and demand was kind of in your scope of work. <laughs> okay. So capacity and demand. So what does that mean? So the capacity is like how big, so how big is your pelvis or not just your, we are, when I'm saying pelvis is not just the bony pelvis, but also these genital hiatus and levator hiatus, like how big are, is the opening to your pelvic floor? And then also how big is your baby? Because if you have someone that is small as very large, like let's just for simplicity, very large uh, pelvis and they have a small baby, large, uh, or like 
a large opening, small thing that goes in the opening, it's going to fit, right? But if the other way you have someone that is very small and they have a very large baby, there's going to be there is a a mismatch between how where the baby needs to go out through the size of the baby. And so we always try to make as the simplest tools that we can. And so one way to simply address this is, okay, can we measure the size of the baby at term, like right before labor, and also what's the size of the muscles of the mom? And so uh, there is actually a recent paper that shows that they did ultrasounds during pregnancy and then afterwards. And they actually found a very big, um, like that they pr pretty but good accuracy between, okay, so these people had a mismatch between the size of the mother and the size of the baby and they actually end up having injury during childbirth versus those that had not such a big mismatch and they they were fine. And so the ultrasound is already in an obstetrics and gynecology clinic. An ultrasound is already at the hospital. So why don't we do this more often? Yeah. Um, I, one of the things, so you're measuring the, the size of the baby's head with ultrasound. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I'm hoping that that's a little bit more accurate than us guessing the baby's weight in an ultrasound um yeah we the weight is like the weight is a compound measure of different lengths and okay. circumference so it's like a made-up thing that someone that okay. form have different formulas that they've named of people but the the diameter and circumference of someone's head is is it's pretty old. standard right like you you we're not because what i hear in my clinic is oh they told me my baby was going to be 10 pounds and then they deliver a eight pound baby you know there's always at least a pound mm -hmm. or more off in their guesstimate of the baby's yeah. weight and so when i read this the, though one like one difficulty is that when the baby's already um in place to deliver it's behind the pubic bone so it's like it's not a simple measure but like with with trained professionals and now there is so much AI in this space that people are doing that pretty easily. So okay. even though it's not like a simple step, it's it's getting easier. Yeah. Okay. That that was my big concern about that. I'm like, wait, how accurate is that ultrasound assessment of the baby's head size? Um, and that's why it's very important to know though if your baby is facing up or facing down. So like, and. The reason for that is because the way the head engages with the pelvis is different if the baby's looking up or looking down. And also because you can um, bend your neck one way, but you can bend your neck the other way, right? And so that happens with babies too. And that's why sometimes they're like, oh, they rotated my baby. And why did they do that? Because they want to try your baby to be as small as possible when it goes yeah. through your birth canal, because then it reduces your risk for injury. Right. And um. I also noticed that there wasn't much mentioned in the paper about baby's position prior to going into labor. Was that considered at all or um, talked From about? A, a mechanical perspective, while the baby is not going through it and stretching the tissues, it's, of course, the tissues change through pregnancy because there is extra weight, there is extra load, but that's not what causes injury. It might cause a changes, but what causes injuries when your baby stretches your muscles and your structures too much and they de detach from their origin points and then you have injury and complaints. It's not because you have pregnancy. And it's also because if it was just from the pregnancy, we would see people that had multiple, like if they had twins or triplets, they would come into your clinic like, oh, I have so much, many more issues. But even though those populations are smaller, you don't have your clinic full with people that had twins, right? And that's one, because they had C-sections, but even if they had C-sections, that would have not protected your pelvic floor if you thought that that's because you have a big weight on top. So that's the reason. Okay. All right. And babies are constantly shifting and turning as they're going through the, the birth process in the canal mm -hmm. as well too, right? Yeah. So cool. Um, could you guys, in your, in your article, you talked about the ease clinical trial. Can you tell us more about that? That sounded interesting, but do you guys remember there's, um, there's ongoing trials to dilate the lower birth canal in the first stage of labor to reduce injury risk. Do you? Yeah, know? that's part of a company called Materna Medical and they are developing a multi-site clinical trial, which means that they are at several hospitals and they have a device that dilates the pelvic floor um, before the baby is born with the, in the sense that like if we pre-stretch the tissues, the tissues know what to do. 
And instead of starting at, let's say, one inch, they are starting at two inches in uh, diameter. So then it's easier to pass a baby than if you start from a small. And you also yeah. mentioned the epino in your, your article as well, which that is no longer, it's not available here in the States. Um, but that had a similar process, but done prior to labor, correct? Mm -hmm. So similar the difference process. is that this maternal trial is done like a couple hours before the baby goes through. So there is still some muscle um, yeah. memory, let's say. I don't think you can call it that, but for simplicity. Right, right, yeah. And if you do it during pregnancy, as we were talking before, how we don't know how the viscoelastic properties are during pregnancy, that's one of the reasons is because they might have not been uh, changed enough for that to to um, have a, a big effect. Well, and, and to me, I love this idea of this trial happening during the labor process, because now we've got all the hormonal um, changes and, and the, the tissues are already being prepped to, to lengthen and mm -hmm. stretch during that birth process, where is doing it prior to those hormones and all the chemical changes that need to happen for labor to progress um, I was talking to a midwife once and she was like, why would we be doing that until the, 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 would she call it the, oh, I forget the term she used, but like the, the makeup of all those hormones and chemicals and everything that make the tissues change and relax prior to the, the baby coming out anyway. And I was like, oh, that's kind of a good point. So that's cool that they're doing it during that labor process. Um, interesting. Do so do you feel from what you've studied with the viscoelasticity that we are able to make effective changes by maybe doing some soft tissue mobilizations or release work or, you know, in, in those structures themselves, can we make effective change or is this just something that I'm born with this tissue and that's the way the tissues are going to be? I think the accurate answer is we don't know. Okay. Like there's no evidence to say that we're affecting change. Mm -hmm. I think it's Lynn, the, the issue that you're running into with measurement, it's like, again, I learned from my engineering colleagues, we need to have valid and reliable ways of measuring things yep. to determine if what we're doing is actually having the, the intended yeah. effect or not. Now, I certainly appreciate, you know, especially in rehabilitation, some of it is a little bit of an art as much as it is a science. Yeah. And if it helps people to feel better, we know kind of, you know, in that biopsychosocial, the the psycho piece, but more so the neurology piece, are we just affecting the nervous system? Even if that's all we're doing for pain relief or to give somebody more confidence and self-efficacy, then I think there's so much benefit in doing that. But I don't think that we can definitively say, we know that we're having an effect on the tissue. Yeah. I. I I just see such significant changes in my clients. And like, if I'm feeling ischial tuberosities and they start off here and by the time I'm done, they're like half the distance, you know, something has changed. I can feel it in my hands and, and everybody stands up and they go, Oh, I feel different. You know, yes, Jenny, totally agree. It may not just be the bones, <laughs> but there is yeah. such a significant change that it's like, I, I just, I want to see if we can try to quantify it and, and see if there is a difference. And I know it's not going to be until we can maybe look at it from MRI studies. Have you guys gotten before and after MRI studies of the pelvic bones that I could look at? <laughs> Has that been looked at, Mariana? <laughs> We, we do have pelvic MRIs of like people that have never been pregnant and those that have been pregnant several times uh, or like one or more times. And, um, but I don't know if anyone has looked at that. Yeah, that's... The, the, the issues with quantifying those changes is as well, it's very hard because we know that pelvic floor dimensions vary across ethnic groups and racial groups. And so if like, if your racial groups are not aligned between what you have for before and what you had after, there's gonna be difference, but is the difference because they are from different ethnic groups or is it the difference because it's a true difference? Right. And so that is, that is like complications, uh, just like from a research standpoint and as engineer, where it's like you measure things in a certain rigorous way, that is like so many co-founders that it's hard to make um, uh, definitively, definitive answers. Yeah. But, and Lynn, I think if you're 
seeing those changes and your patients feel better and function better, then there's value in doing that, right? Mm -hmm. We just, from from research, we just can't (laughs) definitively say that, yes, this change is happening and this is why it's happening and this is how much it's happening and this is how much force Lynn needs to provide to make this much amount of change in this individual. But I do want to take a minor detour, if that's okay, because it's it's a, a personal passion of mine, both because I had hip dysplasia in surgery for it, but also because that is another area of interest of mine. But um, I've gotten a lot of questions about does having surgery to correct dysplasia, which is called a periacetabular osteotomy or a PAO for short, um, does that prevent or preclude somebody from having a vaginal delivery? Because in that surgery, they do surgically fracture your pelvis and they kind of reorient the hip sockets. But in some of the reviews that have been done on this, that surgery does not change the distance of the pelvic outlet, does not affect the pelvic inlet, and there's no reason. I mean, there might be individualized reasons why somebody could not attempt a vaginal birth, but just having a PAO in your history it is not an indicator to say that you have to have a C-section. Okay. And so there are, are a lot of physicians that will counsel patients and say, oh, you had the surgery you can't have a vaginal delivery. And that that's not true. Um, for people that have had the surgery or other hip surgeries, as physical therapists or other rehab providers, we should be counseling birthing people about, okay, who's going to be supporting your le- legs? Does this person know, you know, what positions feel good and not good for your hip now? Are, is there going to be equal force being pulled on both of your legs? So more from a um, a comfort perspective, so as not to irritate that individual's hip pain, but yeah. there's no reason in in it of the surgery of a PAO itself that precludes somebody from having a vaginal delivery. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. That that's super important to know. Um, did you have your surgery prior? Or, or, have you had kiddos, Jenny? Or uh, I have not. Okay. Um, okay. But you could, if you wanted to, have <laughs> had this surgery prior. Yes, PAO would not preclude that. Good, awesome. I'm curious, you guys, um, we have, I know in the past, and this isn't in talking to some midwives, but pelvimetry, the, the study of the, the shapes and the sizes of the pelvic bones used to be really big in at least midwifery practices, but it seems like we've gone away from that. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on, the shapes of the the pelvic bones. I know in my practice, I've you know worked on someone who whose tailbone was sticking straight up into the the canal at a ninety degree angle, and she you know it had forty two hours of labor, and the baby never came out. She needed a C section. I'm like, why were we not assessing this prior to? her going into labor. So I'm curious what your guys' thoughts are on this idea of understanding the pelvic bones and their shape and whether that could preclude a baby from coming through. So from a, like a science and engineering perspective, there is two reasons why we don't do that. One is because if we're doing x-rays to babies and mothers and yeah. it's like <laughs> not doing that anymore. The second was, uh, it's really hard to see bones with ultrasound. And so it's really, it's hard and you're not going to do MRIs on all these people. And so there is these, this science, like science-based reasons why you can't do that. But the reason is also like, even though they did all this pelvometry in the past, they didn't really, they weren't doing anything with it. Like, it's like, okay, yeah, your pelvis is big. It's going to be easier. This pelvis is smaller. Maybe you're going to give you a C-section, but it wasn't much more than that but correct me if i'm mistaken and then we like we look at mris a lot and like i do a lot of work with mris and like people have very weirdly shaped sacrum coccyx junctions sometimes it's just like they were a child they 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 fell on their bottom and they broke their coccyx they never know and it just like got in this weird shape and but because those people are such a small percentage of population like that is and there isn't an easy way to assess it it's like well maybe they should have trying to figure out why your baby's taking so long to come out beforehand like like not let it go that far and then afterwards you understand why 
but it's just like um, it, I don't think there is anything you could do beforehand to understand that because well, like I guess as a physical therapist you could kind of measure it but unfortunately we aren't doing pelvic floor assessments through PT to everyone so we get yeah. into this gray like area like we could be doing this but intervention is not bring, bring benefits to most people so where where is this position where do where do we choose mm. well i don't know you know as as a pt and we have those palpation skills right jenny to <clears throat> be able to to palpate the pelvic bones one of the big things i like to look at is what it that curvature of the sacrum and tailbone right like you said there's all different sorts of shapes and sizes of those sacrums but the more curved that sacrum is, what's that distance from tip of tailbone to pubic bone? You know, like I felt some where it was just like less than two inches from the pubic bone. And so I just let my mamas know, I'm like, if I were you, I would just avoid being on your back during your labor so that, you know, cause that's really going to have to open up for baby to come on out that way. So in that regard, that's how I feel. Am I wrong in thinking that? What do you guys, what are your thoughts on that? No, I, I don't think that you're wrong in thinking that. And I think that's kind of one of the only kind of recommendations or things that we can do now. Yes, we can palpate. I mean, you think about, we palpate the coccyx for a variety of things. And, you know, just because of my work with the clinical practice guideline on constipation, somebody's coccyx is really tucked under that can impact constipation. Right. And yeah. so I, even though it, um, it wasn't one of the highest recommended um, interventions in the guideline, you know, I will start with kind of the level one a evidence, but sometimes I'm doing some mobilization to somebody's coccyx. Um, and so, you know, I think looking at that is not wrong. I think it could be helpful. And again, from that AJOG review in 2022 that looked at birthing positions, you know, variable effects for different people, but it seems reasonable if it's that individual in front of you that your feeling has a really flexed coccyx, may, you know, I don't think the advice is bad to say, hey, maybe you should try birthing in a position where there's nothing blocking that coccyx from extending. Yeah, absolutely. Well, cool. Do you guys have any last um, comments or anything that you want us as practitioners to know about this review or about your work in general? Like what would be helpful for us for that clinical application of what you all know? So, you know, I think, like I said at the beginning, just kind of appreciating from the prolapse perspective that there's this really easy measurement that you could be making in the clinic that can give you a lot of information. Now, taking that measurement doesn't mean that you're going to change that measurement, but what it does is it helps you with um, decision-making and, and plan of care development to say, you know, maybe this is somebody that's going to also need um, some some external support on board, or maybe that distance is so big that maybe, uh, you know, something like a pessary is not going to work for them, or they need a custom pessary with, you know, there's, there's uh, companies like Cosm that are coming out with these individualized pessaries. So kind of taking that measurement, knowing what that measurement means, and then knowing how you need to change or direct the plan of care and educate your patient based on that, I think is really the biggest takeaway. Um, and just, I guess, a little preview into things to come is that both Mariana and myself are working on slightly different things as it relates to birth injury, um, but we're both working to try to untangle this dilemma more and then also translate that into what does this mean for the clinician practicing today? So stay tuned. Jenny, thank you, thank you, thank you. I <laughs> so appreciate that. All right, Mariana, what any last thoughts for you? I think uh, I would say that, um, as you were saying earlier, Lynn, that you see lots of things in clinics and you see patterns and sometimes like, am I really measuring this? Is this really different between these people? And it's like, my job is is to do research and I, I'm very interested in, in this in this area and in, in, in preventing injury from happening. So like sometimes people have research questions and just if you have one, just please reach out and we can talk and we can see like, okay, do we have data? We have MRIs, we have ultrasounds. Can we measure what you are seeing? Can we help you figure out, is this really a true uh, thing that we can measure and quantify? Because 
only with measuring and quantifying, we can move science forward and then moving science forward, we can move clinical practice forward. So like, please reach out to us if you have any questions that you would like to address. We can always try to guide you on like, oh, this is what the literature says. And um, yeah, we are like research are always very happy to help people understanding the landscape and improving their clinical practice. So please reach out if you have any questions. Okay, I'm calling you. <laughs> you brought tears to my eyes, Mariana, because it, it's like, oh, I just see this over and over and over again. And and like you, I I know that I'm making some change and, and I'm sensing it's with the bones, but I know I'm affecting everything in there. And I just really, it's so effective that I really want to get this idea into into more people's minds and hands and ideas. And I will definitely would love to reach out and talk to you more about this. So thank you. Thank you both for all that you're doing in trying to bring more awareness to childbirth and the implication and impact that it has on our clients, because it's huge, as we all know, and just so important. And I'm so grateful for both of you for the work that you're doing in this world. And thank you so much for giving us your time today and sharing your expertise and for doing the work and writing these papers and trying to make that change. So I'm so incredibly grateful to both of you. Thank you for being here. All thank right, you so much for having us, Lynn. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for listening in. I hope this was helpful to you all. And we will look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Here is to smoother births and faster recoveries. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Today's podcast was brought to you by the Institute for Birth Healing. To discover more, visit instituteforbirthhealing.com. To claim $50 off of any online course, use coupon code PODCAST50 at checkout. Till next time, I'm Lynn Schulte, founder of the Institute for Birth Healing.